going to begin the book with the story that you just shared with us about your son on the airplane. Yes. And I, even though I had heard you tell it before, reading it really gave me chills. Um, what struck me most about it was where your son said, I don't even know why I was thinking yeah. that. I think that really shows how insidious and pervasive these biases can be. And so my first question to you is, what was he thinking about? Where does this all come from? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And um, it is a question that was perplexing to him, right? Um, and, and my question to him kind of forced him to try to think about that and, and to um, try to um, not sort of just accept that, but to evaluate it as, as he's thinking about it, to, to try to make it conscious uh, in a way. But, um, but yes, these associations kind of come from both um, how uh, our brains are wired, our brains are wired to take shortcuts, we are wired to categorize, and, and not just categorize people, but to categorize everything around us, right? Uh, furniture and, you know, cars and, you know, who would, would, you name it, right? But we also categorize people. Um, we, uh, our brains are, are wired for stereotyping, another shortcut that, that we use and once people are in those categories, um, we have, you know, beliefs about the people in those categories that can get triggered automatically. But it's not just our brain functioning, our, our, our we, you know, we're, we have brains, but we're in a, we're in a society, right? And so if you see um, societal inequalities and so forth, um, you know, that affects, you know, how we think, it affects our biases. Um, um, also, if you, um, you know, learn uh, what the stereotypes are about the groups are, uh, that are in your society, if there are narratives uh, that explain the inequalities um, in a way, um, you know, such that, you know, it's about, you know, those people that they're in this position um, in society and they're, you know, playing these kinds of roles um, rather than, um, you know, the structural forces rather than, you know, situational. So all of that matters. Um, e even things like how we, how we live, right? We, we live um, oftentimes in segregated spaces, and that can have a real effect on us, not just on how we think about people, but even how we see people, right? Our, our brains, um, you know, when you're, when you're a little kid, and, and even when you're an infant, um, you're, you're still, your brain is practicing on faces and how to recognize faces from people of your own racial group. And they find, they find that even babies as young as three months of age already are showing a preference for faces of their own group. And so that starts to shape us, right? So we oftentimes will think about policies um, kind of shaping um, economic opportunities and so forth, but policies can affect our brains. The policies can affect who we are. Um, so, so it's real. It's, it's a significant thing. So I think one of the things you say in your book is that um, exposure isn't a silver bullet. Right. But um, when we look at that face association that you mentioned, this, the similarity um, to faces that we see, is there something about the homogeneity of our neighborhoods and the segregation of our cities that contributes to harboring these biases and leaving them unexamined. Yes, yes, certainly. Um, but again, you know, contact is, is definitely not a, a silver bullet because it really depends on the nature of the contact. We, we used to think that just bring people together and um, it'll be okay. People will recognize um, that, um, you know, that, that we're more alike than, uh, than not and, and people will replace the stereotypes that they have about with real information, but if you bring people together in situations where it's an unequal um, status, where, where you're not bringing groups together that have equal status, or if you bring people together and you're not, um, you know, it's not a cooperative uh, kind of thing, it's more competitive, um, if you bring people together and it's not sanctioned by leaders in the space, um, so there are all these conditions of contact that matter. If you don't have the right conditions, um, you can actually make it worse. You can actually increase people's uh, biases rather than decrease them. So uh, you heard it here first. You know, exposure and contact is not enough. Yeah. <laughs> Next time you go to the workplace, they want to do a Taco Tuesday. <laughs> Stanford, that that's not going to work. <laughs> um, so it's clear that none of us are immune from bias. Yes. Three-month-olds, five-year-olds, adults. <clears throat> yep. um, 
So while that's true, none of us are immune. We're all absorbing all of these thoughts all the time. Some right. of us have more power and influence than others. That's true. Uh, and our biases, if we have more power and influence, can have a greater impact on society. Yes. So talk a little bit about what that looks like, the power imbalance, and what, what the um, the acting out, acting on biases can do to it. Well, if you have more power, right, you can, um, you know, shape the narratives that, that people have um, about a group uh, that has less power. Um, if you have more power, you can um, shape your minds. So next door has power. Uh, so it's not just individuals, right? It's our institutions and, and our organizations, our workplaces. So next door is in 95% of our neighborhoods. So when they decide to put a checklist up, you know, that's affecting all of us, right? It's not just affecting us as individuals or even just the people in our local worlds. It's affecting, having this enormous impact. So with that power, they have a lot of responsibility, right? We, we want to use our institutions and our organizations and our workplaces to mitigate bias rather than to perpetuate it. One of the things I often tell people, and I'd love to selfishly take a minute to check if I'm right, is, um, is if, that in my quest to, to help people understand bias, my goal is not for people to suddenly be bias free, because right. I don't think that's a reasonable expectation. So right. I tell them, it's not that you're never going to have the first thought, right. it's that I want you to have the second thought. Right. So where did that come from? Right. So what can people do once they are like, oh wait, where did that come from? What's a, what's a good follow-up thought in that, um, in that sort of self-reflection? Well, in the self-reflection itself, right? When you're slowing things down, you can actually sort of think about um, not just where that came from, but um, you know, uh, you, you can sort of think about what the, what the stereotype might be, right? That, that you're um, using to, to, you know, make a decision. So, so you can, you can do, you can do things like that. I mean, you can do a lot. I think um, it's almost um, slowing things down and, and, and sort of practicing, um, you know, responding a different way. And if you practice it enough, then that thing can be kind of the automatic thing. I, I would relate this actually to that shoot, don't shoot exercise. Um, a lot of people feel like, you know, in police departments or workplaces or wherever you are, um, to mitigate bias, you need a bias training. Mm. But you don't always need the bias training. Sometimes you can just train people to do their jobs better. So, <laughs> who would have thought, right? So, <laughs> so, for the police, as it turns out, um, the more interactive use of force training they get, um, the less likely it is that they sh uh, mistakenly, you know, shoot a black person more so than a, than a white person. So they don't show that effect if they have a lot of training because. What happens is, is that you get repetitive training in a way that that becomes automatic and that can override this association that you've had in place before. So it sounds like what you're saying <laughs> is that none of us come into our workplaces or our other contexts without bias. Okay? But there's plenty that we can do within those institutions to unlearn those and learn new habits. Right. And I'm saying that our institutions should play a big role in this because they create the conditions, they create the social environments that we're in. And so you want, you don't want those environments to um, actually further bias, right? You, you need to figure out ways to mitigate bias in, in, the, in the spaces that you control. about bias uh, makes people think you're accusing them of something. Mm -hmm. And it immediately puts people on the defensive. Mm -hmm. But what I hear when you say, when you when you make that recommendation is that, in fact, unless we acknowledge that we're all walking around with this conditioning, right. and then build systems and structures and policies to proactively try and unravel them or mitigate them, that's exactly right. all that's going to happen is they're going to play out unconsciously. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> and not talking about it doesn't help. Not talking about bias doesn't help. Being colorblind doesn't help. Oh, wow. <laughs> There's a lot of research on that. Oh, well, I mean, there is, there's a lot of research, and I think people oftentimes will think, well, if I don't see color, then I can't be biased. But 
with um, you know, there's research on that that is just doesn't support that. So, for example, I'll give you an example in the education context. Now, a lot of our schools across the country um, really believe in this colorblind ideology, and in teachers and administrators, it's all about being colorblind and you're not supposed to notice race or talk about race. In fact, there's research showing that by the time children are 10 years old, they already know that it's improper to ever mention race or notice race, and so nobody's discussing it, right? And so uh, they did a study with um, uh, fourth and fifth graders at a school, and they uh, were interested in sort of what being taught this colorblind ideology did for their perceptions of discrimination. So they took um, half of those students and they uh, told them that, hey, we all want to be egalitarian, we believe in this, so the best way uh, the, the, to be a good person, you should be colorblind. That's how we achieve this. For the other group of fourth and fifth graders, they told them, hey, uh, we believe in racial equality, that's what we want to strive for, that kind of thing, same thing. Uh, but now they said, um, so what we want to do is to value diversity. And then they exposed uh, these students to this uh, situation where a kid knocked a black kid down on the um, soccer field, I think punched him. And they said, well, why did you do that? And the kid said, because he's black. Okay, so pretty, you know, blatant, right? Um, and so they asked these children, do you think this is um, uh, an instance of uh, racial discrimination, right? So for the children who were in the value diversity condition of the study, 80% of them, the vast majority of them said, yes, this is discrimination. But when you look at the children who were in the condition of the study where they're told to value, I mean, to, to, that colorblindness is the way to go, only half of them actually um, thought that that uh, situation um, was an example of discrimination. And even uh, when these children told their teachers they were trying to describe what happened, they, they, they described the situation in such a way that the teachers um, didn't think it was a big deal and said that they wouldn't intervene. So, so if the whole purpose of being colorblind is so that we can combat inequality, you know, it does the opposite. I mean, it leaves us um, um, not even seeing uh, the inequality that we're facing and, and leaving, you know, in this case, the children in harm's way where you don't even have adults who can come in and um, rectify the situation. So, so it's, not, it's not the panacea we like to believe it is. Um, you know, I have a lot of parents who ask me questions, which is ironic because I have no children and no interest in children. Um, <laughs> Y'all's children are great. I don't want to put myself in. But they ask me lots of questions about parenting. And one of the things I hear a lot is I want to raise children who are, you know, who respect diversity, who aren't racist, who, who are ready for the world. Yep. And so what I tell them is in our house, we don't see color, we treat everyone the same. You know, we believe everyone is equal. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like what you're saying is that is ill preparing these yeah. children for exactly the kind of things that they're trying to achieve. Yeah, you, you're just, you know, they're just spending for themselves. But I'll tell you a quick story about that. I, uh, I one of my sons, the youngest, uh, he was in elementary school, and the, the school principal asked me to come in and talk about my work. And I'm like, talk about my work. This is like an all school assembly. And I'm like, you know what I do? And <laughs> Sometimes the parents and the grandparents would come, and I just imagine, you know, the people just giving me the stink eye from the back row, you know. <laughs> you know. What am I doing to their innocent children, right? So I definitely did not want to go. But then one day when I was taking um, my son to school, I'm listening to NPR, and at that time um, there were uh, protests in Baltimore. And uh, this was around the time of Freddie Way, right? And so I'm listening to it, and I hear this small voice from the back seat. And he says, Mommy, Mommy, why is Baltimore on fire? And I thought, wow. You know, just because we're not talking to our children about these issues, it doesn't protect them, actually. They're hearing, they're taking in the same information we're taking in, 
and then we're leaving them all on their own to try to figure it out. And, but that doesn't protect them. I mean, that hampers them in a way. So I did a 180 on that. I did that very moment. I was so excited to go to school. I talked to those children about what I did. I showed those images. We talked, right? And we talked about everything. We talked about um, body-worn cameras and all kinds of things. And they had a lot to say. Even the kindergartners had their hands. They were raising their hands. They wanted to participate and they were ready for the conversation. So sometimes we don't give our children enough credit. And they're living in the same world we are. They are. They're seeing the same things we are. They are. They're worried about the same things we are. Right. Um, so we are haunted at, seemingly every week these days um, with, uh, with stories of primarily unarmed black men and women being. Um, shot people by police. Um, what, something that you do in your book that I found really compelling was you sort of compiled all of the research that you've done to help explain how bias might be playing a role in each um, sort of discrete part of a police interaction. Yeah. And in fact, you use the killing, um, the 2016 killing of Terrence Crusher as a case study in yeah. that. Can you talk about how um, can you paint a picture for us about how bias may play a role in that tragedy? Right. So at first, I want to just say um, that you know I don't you know I, I have never um, actually looked at uh, Tulsa police departments, their policies around use of force and all of that, and and it's hard as a researcher to um, make um, you know sort of broad claims about any specific case. And so normally uh, what we do as researchers, we sort of look for patterns, you know, across many cases and across many people. Um, but, um, you know, that says, right? You're, you're not describing anything in this situation. Right, right. But, but, but that said, there's a lot of research that's relevant, you know, to, to that case. Um, you know, a lot of the research that I talked about here today, right, um, even um, sort, of, uh, sort of what, um, you know, why is it that too much culture uh, captured the attention of, of, of the police, right? Um, we have studies showing that when people, um, and even police officers, when they're thinking about violent crime, um, you know, their, their, their focus um, goes to, um, you know, black people and not white people. So that's where the focus goes. And so we can show that in, in, in studies. Um, even um, sort of looking at, um, you know, uh, body movement, actually. So so what is furtive movement, right? What is threatening movement? And, and how do we determine that? And how does race play a role in what we see as furtive, what we see as threatening? So there could be, you know, an issue there, right? Um, because, you know, Terrence Crutcher was walking away, and, you know, so, so the, you know, how he uh, moved uh, could have been seen as more threatening in that situation um, than if he were white and, and had the same movements. So we've done studies on this, on, on body movement, laboratory studies, where we have the identical movement, um, but we uh, look to see if people see it as more aggressive and threatening when um, the person is black, and they do. Um, so there's that, and then there's also, um, Research that I didn't do, but I talk about in the book, is that people see um, black bodies uh, as bigger and stronger and more formidable. And, and so there's research you know, showing that when you have um, th that idea about um, the black body, for example, people are um, you know, more uh, willing to sort of think that uh, you know, force should be used or more force should be used to subdue someone who's black. So there's that, um, and then there's also just, you know, whether you see a weapon or not, which we talked about too, right? So, you know, um, just because that association between blackness and crime is so strong, um, it, it kind of readies you uh, to uh, see uh, weapons. You can you pick them up faster, but you, it, it actually, um, for um, white Americans, you get the, just the opposite effect, where it takes you longer to even register that, oh, he's, he has a gun um, or he has a knife. So all of those things, all of those studies that I presented um, are uh, relevant, um, you know, I believe, to uh, cases like that, but also, you know, relevant to other, other kinds of things, just like everyday routine stops as well.
have gotten the warning that we need to wrap up. Oh, so I will need to ask one last question. So you've been doing bias research for decades. This is yes. nothing new. This concept is not new to you. No, it's not. But I do think that bias has become a bit of a buzzword in recent, yeah. maybe the last two or three years. Yeah. Um, especially in sort of the DNI or cultural competency space. Yeah. And one of the concerns I've heard about all the attention being paid to implicit bias is that it opens the door to sort of deflecting attention for racism. Mm -hmm. That if we all have bias, then none of us are actually responsible and we're all just operating from a bias and it's not anyone's fault and there's no accountability and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Um, there's this notion that if we, um, if we all have bias, then it, it allows us to sort of deny culpability for racism. So what's your response to that? I mean, so that's real, and there's research on that too. When you, um, when, when something is a norm or is perceived as a norm, uh, people are just less worried about it. And sometimes um, they think that not, not only are things that way, um, they think that things are supposed to be that way or they have to be that way. So there's a danger there in normalizing it. But the fact is, um, it, I mean, it is. I mean, you can't um, kind of deny uh, what we know as, as, as researchers, but I think that just because, um, you know, we're all vulnerable to bias doesn't mean we have no responsibility, we have no accountability. That doesn't mean that at all. It means actually that we uh, need to be more accountable uh, because of, of that propensity. We need to be more accountable. Our institutions or organizations need to be more accountable, more mindful. Uh, because of the real threat of, of bias and the threat that, of, of the harm that, that it can do to so many people. So it's not letting people off the hook, it's, it's encouraging them to um, actually um, step up and uh, actually uh, do what's necessary uh, to uh, mitigate this. Thank you so much, Dr. Emmer. Please join me in